where the fresh and rolling fields merge seamlessly into a dense thicket, where the foaming surf abuts against the hardwoods of a sylvan fortress, where creeping vines and forest shoots reach towards the blue skies, one creature claims supreme dominion over all that is held within. Fanciful images of lithe creatures darting between shadowed canopies capture the imagination. Being silent and slender, whose vast legions number the forest leaves and who staunchly defend their sylvan realm with life and blood. A race that reveres earthly gods and nature itself, whose shamans and druids steward the cycle of life and death, cultivating growth and understanding the interconnectedness of life around them to a point where they are seen as an extension of nature's will. These words and more conjure images of a race of creatures that is well known across the plains, but often misunderstood. A race that stands aloof from civilization and abhors artifice. A race with myriad communities, religions, and cultures, but that stand united under the banner of their namesake, the Elves. Hey lore lovers, my name's Eric with the Lore Barbarians. We share the lore and stories of many fantasy settings to strengthen the connection between people and their passions. Welcome to the latest installment of our Study In series, highlighting a specific creature type within Magic the Gathering's vast multiverse. Today we'll be taking a study in nature as we seek to uncover the deep connection with natural planes and learn the social structures of one of the most prevalent creature types of MTG, the Elf. These videos are meant to act as a cursory guide, introducing the characteristics shared among elves of different planes and uncovering the differences among them on the most noteworthy realms. We won't meticulously dissect every elf race on every plane, but rather instill a general sense of what it means to be an elf in MTG. But before we begin, I want to give a huge thanks to all of my supporters over on Patreon. Their patronage means the world to me and helps the channel grow and improve. The support is much appreciated. Alright, let's dive in. Elves are a pervasive and archetypal fantasy race across mythology and beyond universes. From the elves of Tolkien's Middle-earth, to the dark elves of the Forbidden Realms, to the Leosalfar of Norse mythology, and the multiverse of Magic the Gathering is no different. Elves exist across the plains, sharing and unifying characteristics, but also with distinct cultures and proclivities that distinguish them from another. Almost all elves share a reverence towards nature, worshipping the landscape and meticulously tending new growth. As such, they are the marquee creature type for green mana. Green mana naturally abounds in forests and other locations of raw primordial growth. It represents nature, harmony, and wisdom through interdependent understanding. Elves across the blind eternities devote their lives to understanding the life that surrounds them, to stewarding the natural cycle of growth and decay, and at times to protecting their homes from encroachment by civilization or artificial progress. The flavor text of Elvish Archdruid highlights the deep connection elves have to their forest environs and states, The elves tend the forest, and the forest sustains the elves. My role is to ensure that the cycle continues. Though a staggering 67% of the more than 500 cards printed with the creature type are affiliated with green mana, elves also have a strong connection to black and white mana. Black represents the natural process of death and decay that all beings must endure. Elves that are master of cultivation use the nutrients provided from decay to fuel new growth in a sort of perpetual reincarnation. White mana represents unity and order, two pillars key to many elvish societies. Hierarchical and community seeking by nature, white mana offers elves the structure and interdependence necessary to best protect their forest dwellings. Most elves in magic have physical features similar to their trope displayed in other fantasy universes. They're often depicted with slender forms that possess the requisite lithe agility to stride canopy branches and deftly track prey or foes. This natural grace is frequently coupled with the presence of pointed ears or teeth, the most discernible feature that separates elves from humans. Elves as a race have a lifespan far longer than that of their human counterpart. They can live centuries or millennia, with some elves claiming near immortality. Their long lives are paired with an esoteric and isolated lifestyle, as most elves tend to shy from large urban centers or places of great civilization, choosing instead to withdraw into the forests they share deep roots with. This has the effect of generating an aura of wonder and mysticism. Theirs is a race often misunderstood by others who dwell within the plains they populate. A key member of elvish society is the druid or shaman. These elves have such a strong bond with the land that they distinguish themselves even amongst their brethren. 
they have an innate ability to draw on the strength of the force that surrounds them, or weave powerful mana ley lines to fuel growth. This is emphasized in many of the elf card activated abilities to generate mana or search for lands. And it's a skill highlighted in the flavor text of Elvish Mystic, in which the elf planeswalker Nissa Ravain states, Life grows everywhere. My kin merely find those places where it grows strongest. But with such reverence for the forest comes a natural duty to defend it. Many elvish societies have elite warriors that patrol their domains, often mounted atop woodland beasts they've bonded with, as seen in Steel Leaf Champion and Tel Jalad Outriders. Many elves are also known for their mastery of the bow, striking from a great distance with astonishing accuracy before retreating into the shadowed underbrush. Their archers rank among the most skilled in the multiverse, and we see their efforts on display in cards like Scattershot Archer and Titania's Chosen. With their similarities discussed, it's time to explore the various differences between elves across the multiverse. What makes each unique? What cultural values they maintain and how their environment alters their connection to nature? We'll begin where most things do, at the nexus of the multiverse on the plane of Dominaria. Dominaria's scale is massive in both space and time compared to many other locations in the multiverse. Its geography spans several large continents, oceans, and archipelagos, an impressive expanse matched only by the richness of its history. Myriad elf races have called Dominaria home throughout the ages and have spread to populate many of its major landmasses. Some were ancient civilizations whose fire was snuffed by atrocity, while others have survived countless generations and continued to protect the lands that they claim to. We'll begin with the elves of Terrasier. The Argothian elves inhabited the island of Argoth, just south of Terrasier's main landmass, from at least negative 5000 AR up until the Brothers' War ravaged the continent in the first century AR. When their verdant, isolated island home was discovered by Urza and Mishra's exploratory parties, each brother tilled the land, uprooted the forest, and exhausted the natural resources until little remained. When Urza ended the Brothers' War by detonating the Golgothian Silex, the blast completely obliterated Argoth and plunged it into the ocean. The elves that dwelt here were worshippers of Titania, a powerful elemental manifestation of Argoth's rich nature. Their priests tended the forest and offered ritual prayer to Titania, while Argothian warriors staunchly defended their realm against any trespasser who harmed the forest. Elves often worked with other creatures of Argoth's forest, which we can see in the card Symbiosis, and in Acridian, we see the insects they rode as mounts. During the Brothers' War, Argothian elves rallied behind Titania and fought valiantly against both sides, and the card Elvish Herder highlights the elves' ability to stir nature and wild beasts to combat the artificer's mechanical monstrosities. Their efforts were in vain and have long been forgotten. The Argothian elves' culture and civilization was destroyed in the Silex Blast. Those elves that survived the Brothers' War sought refuge on the mainland forest of Findhorn and recovered from catastrophe during the time of ice that soon blanketed the land. Their descendants became the Findhorn Elves. Rather than Titania, the Findhorn Elves were wholly devoted to the Planeswalker Freilis, who used her nature magic to protect the elves in their forest home from the biting frost. Her boon is highlighted in the flavor text of Giant Growth, which reads, Here in Findhorn, the goddess Freilis is generous to her children. Unlike their isolationist forebears, the Findhorn Elves brokered a tentative alliance with the humans of Kjeldor and founded a knightly order known as the Juniper Order. The flavor text of Juniper Order Ranger enlightens us and states, To protect the alliance between Kjeldor and Yavimaya, they trained in the ways of both. Like most other races, the Findhorn Elves died out during the Great Thaw and subsequent Flood Age, their homes inundated by growing sea levels in warmer climates. The last notable race of elves on Terrasier are those that dwell within the sentient forest of Yavimaya. Like all other creatures, plants, insects, and beasts, Yavimaya elves share a hive mind like connection to the forest itself, their thoughts related to the forest, and their wills shaped by Yavimaya's own. This brings the elves that dwell here a deeper connection to nature than any other. They are literally part of the forest, a fact that makes them quite unique and has a large role on their temperament and culture. This connection is explored in the flavor text of Heart Warden, which reads, in Lanawar, we tend the forest's boughs and branches. In Yavamaya, we are part of them. Yavamaya elves have distinct spindly frames which assist in their camouflage and gives them appearance of living tree branches, which we see in the card Elvish Lookout. Yavamaya elves revere the Mero sorcerer Multani as a manifestation of the forest sentience, and they fought bravely against Phyrexians during the invasion. 
Several other races of elves dwell beyond the continent of Tercier. Many can be found in the archipelago surrounding Arona, which is frequently referred to as the Domains. Here, perhaps the most notable of elves dwell within the forest of Lanawar. Lanawar elves are highly xenophobic, eyeing outsiders with suspicion, if not outright derision and fury. They often lead their questions with a flurry of blades or loosening of bolts. Within the dense foliage, Lanawar elves live in seven separate kingdoms known as Elfhams, whose administrative and diplomatic center rests within well-secured walls. These Elfhams are separated vertically from the canopy to the forest floor, and the hame in which an elf is born determines their cultural upbringing, which we can read in the flavor text of Lanawar Scout. Lanawar Elfhams occupy different heights within the Great Forest. Elves of the Loredal and Kelfe Hames can see neither earth nor sky. Like the elves of Findhorn, Lanawar was spared from the worst of the Ice Age by the planeswalker Freilis, and so they worship her as their goddess. This is highlighted in the ability of her planeswalker card to generate a Lanawar elf creature token. At their core, elves of Lanawar are martial in culture and steadfast in their aggressive defense of the forest they call home. They have many elite warriors and mounted knights that patrol the canopy and undergrowth. The Lanawar military is supplemented by their powerful druids and naturalists, which bond to other creatures and harness the raw power of the forest. We can see this unfold in cards like Elfham Druid. These elves are also distinct in the presence of facial paints or tattoos, meant to signify social standing or genealogy. The elves of Lanawar are among the oldest creatures on Dominaria. They're extremely long-lived, even by elvish standards, and can easily have a lifespan surpassing centuries or millennia. They use their experience and their ability to recall the past, to better steward their future, which we can see in the flavor text of cards like Lanawar Tribe which reads, Lanawar remembers the Ice Age, the Phyrexian invasion, and the Rift Era. So long as we draw breath, we will ensure such disasters never threaten our world again. And in Lanawar Visionary, the elves of Lanawar look to their past to determine the shape of their future. The Sky Shroud elves have a tumultuous past filled with forced displacement to cross the blind eternities. Original inhabitants of Dominaria that populated a mangrove forest above brackish water and lived in harmony with a merfolk race submerged beneath the surf. The elves' ancestors were captured in an overlay rift fabricated by the Phyrexian Evencar of Wrath and transferred to the artificial plane in the years leading up to invasion. The elves, the forest, and even much of the surrounding water were ripped from Dominaria, hurtled between plains, and transplanted to Wrath. The forest took hold and spread quickly, becoming the dense thicket known as Sky Shroud, whose root system suffocated the merfolk living below the water. In this new, unfamiliar, and dangerous world, the Sky Shroud elves took comfort in what they knew, the trees, leaves, and branches of the forest. But Sky Shroud took on a threatening life of its own, and the elves granted it due trepidation. Seen in the flavor text of Sky Shroud Ranger, which states, Not even the elves truly know the Sky Shroud Forest. The rangers are merely the best equipped to handle its uncertainty. Just as they had grown comfortable in their new realm, the Sky Shroud elves and forest were once again displaced, returning to Dominaria during the Phyrexian invasion with the Wrathy overlay. Unfortunately, they were thrown into Keld's frozen tundra, a desolate and barren land whose bone chilling cold ate away at the forest. With nature turned against them, the elves could do little but pray, and their prayers were answered once again by the planeswalker Freilis, who cast a protective spell around Sky Shroud that warded the forest from the biting frosts, which is highlighted in the Arden flavor text of Sky Shroud Blessing. This divine intervention has led the elves of Sky Shroud to worship Freilis much like those of Lanawar and Findhorn. Eladomri, Lord of Leaves, is the most notable elf from Sky Shroud, who acted as their leader and forged an alliance with other Rathi races against Phyrexia. Other lesser tribes and cultures can be found across Dominaria. The Quirion elves inhabit the island of Karandor north of Jamura. Isolated from much other civilization and bursting with verdant forces, Karandor is steeped with mana, and the Quirion are experts at extracting it. Their members are deeply tied to natural growth, even among other elves, and their druids are the most adept at taming such primordial surges. We see this in the ability of nearly all Quirion elf cards to generate mana or additional lands. The Wirewood elves of Otaria were born from necessity in the years following Phyrexia's invasion. Refugees that had fled lands ravaged by war, the Wirewood were disparate and disjointed clans that quickly took safety in Wirewood's brambles and formed a community of shared need. These elves are masters of symbiosis, literally weaving nature into their own bodies, which we can see in the cards Wirewood Symbiote and Symbiotic Elf. 
When the Marari artifact arrived on Otaria, the Wirewood Elves weren't immune to its surges of power and mutating aura. Many were transformed into monstrosities, which we can see in cards like Wirewood Guardian and Elvish Aberration. On the shifting lands and hostile environment of Zendikar, where death comes to the ill-prepared, mobility and adaptability are paramount for survival, and the elves of this plane perfectly exemplify such characteristics. More so than elves of other planes, those that dwell on Zendikar have a keen sense of its verticality. Massive jotty tree forests reach for the skies and harbor entire elvish cities on their boughs. But even beyond them lie countless landmasses suspended in space and connected by little. To scale such heights and brave such elements, Zendikari elves are master rope casters and mountain climbers, which we can see on display in the art of Tejuru Stalwart. Zendikar's ever-shifting environment allows no purchase for a sedentary lifestyle, and these elves are more nomadic in nature than elves of other planes. Rather, they organize themselves into three broad and free-flowing nations based on a set of shared beliefs and ideals instead of a common realm. Two of these nations are found within the primordial forests and marshlands of Balagad. The Jiraga Nation are a collection of loosely affiliated tribes that are highly isolationist and supremacist, harboring disdain for even other elf nations. Choosing as their hunting grounds the dense thickets surrounding peat bogs, the Jiraga Nation have developed a rich oral culture in which they share their histories, weave tales of heroism, and commune with their ancestors. We can hear their deep connection to the spoken word in the title of cards like Jiraga Bard, Jiraga Tree Speaker, and Jiraga Warcaller. This nation was devastated with the emergence of the Eldrazi who consumed much of Valaget. Precious few survivors remained to steward the Jiraga way of life. The second great elf nation is that of the Moldaya, that also dwelt within the continent of Balaged, primarily in the Goom Wilds. The discerning feature that separate Moldaya from Jiraga are the presence of face paints and tattoos within Moldaya society, which we can see in Moldaya channelers. This nation is one steeped in mysticism and a special form of necromancy that allows their druidic and spiritual leaders to commune with the spirits of ancestors long departed. This powerful magic allows great elves like Obun, Moldaya ancestor, to advise and steward their people from beyond death. Greenweaver Druid depicts the occult powers of Moldaya oracles, the flavor text of which reads, The other tribes call them fanatics, but none deny that the Moldaya elves have an iron-strong bond to some force greater than themselves. The Moldaya hold their secrets close and avoid contact with the other nations. Like Jiraga, their numbers have been utterly depleted with the battle for Zendikar, most having lost their lives to countless Eldrazi hordes. What few remain are led by Mina and Den Wildborn. Their flavor text recounts this harrowing tale. Greenweaver Mina and her twin brother Den lead the last of the Moldaya into an uncertain future. The Tajuru Nation represents the final of the three elvish societies and it's the largest by number. These elves are found within the massive treetops and floating islands of Marasa. The Tajuru are master line slingers and repellers, navigating even the most dangerous terrain with ease which allows them to expand their nomadic routes and interact with other races in a far more open manner than the other nations. Their skills are on display in the Arden flavor text of Tejuru Snarecaster, which depicts an elvish slinger and reads, Elves of the Tejuru nation spend their lives in the ancient Jati tree's expansive canopy, some living and dying without ever touching the ground. This nation are also adept in the ways of war, and their ability to navigate harsh terrain grants them great skill in stealth or ambush attacks. These elves are also deeply connected to the natural life that abounds within Marassa's forest bonding with and riding beasts as mounted knights. We see this on display in cards like Tejuru Beastmaster and Tejuru Pathwarden, where this nation valiantly stood its ground and beat back the Eldrazi invasion that threatened all of Zendikar. Regardless of tribe or nation, Zendikar's elves are highly in tune with the burgeoning growth that fills this mana-rich plain. The fairy tale wilds and sunbathed hills of Lorwyn are home to many creatures that share in the atmosphere of content and abundance, which is pervasive across the plain. The elves of this plain are the dominant race, and although they have an exterior of idyllic beauty that mirror their environs, Lorwyn elves have a grim purpose they execute with wickedness. Lorwyn's elves are singularly focused on the pursuit of physical perfection. Theirs is a culture obsessed with beauty that grants no purchase to the tarnished or imperfect. The elves are supremacists that abhor anything considered unsightly, and most everything falls short of their rigid standards. In fact, beauty is what gives their society structure 
and those deemed most pure also command the most power. This is summarized in the card Elvish Promenade, which reads, The faultless and immaculate castes form the lower tiers of Elvish society, with the exquisite caste above them. At the pinnacle is the perfect, a consummate blend of aristocrat and predator. Elves are also divided into tribes or clans, the three most notable being the Giltleaf, Ren's Run, and Lissalana. As seen in the art of many cards, Lorwyn elves are physically distinguishable from elves of other planes by the presence of twinned curved horns emanating from their heads. The elves' quest for purity and grace doesn't merely end at contempt for other creatures. Lorwyn elves actively track down and slay what they call eye blights, creatures they've deemed as grotesque mockeries that taunt natural beauty with their existence. Their brutal efficiency is highlighted in cards like Eye Blight Massacre and Eye Blight Assassin. These elves are filled with the thrill of the hunt and organize themselves into hunting sorties called Winnowers, who are led by a hunt master displayed in the cards Moonglove Winnower and Giltleaf Winnower. While the flavor text of Eye Blight's ending beautifully illustrates elvish convictions, it reads, Those without beauty are Lorwyn's greatest tumor. The Winnowers have an unpleasant duty, but a necessary one. As one might imagine, their close association with death and assassination has led to a strong base in black mana, and Lorwyn elves are one of the few races of elves that tap into the powers this color represents. But like all things on Lorwyn, the elves retain a second nature hidden deep, but that is beckoned forth when the great aurora sweeps across the plain and transforms idyllic Lorwyn into dark, oppressive Shadowmoor. Like two sides of a coin that can't be separated, Shadowmoor elves retain their foundational characteristics but have a different face about them. Rather than cool, grotesque eye blights, Shadowmoor elves cultivate the fragile and fleeting beauty that springs from the land, which we can see in the card Bloom Tender, whose flavor text states, Beauty is a seed, waiting to blossom under her capable hands. In a deadly race against the clock, they trek across Shadowmoor's dangerous gloom to beckon forth light in a grim world, creating and infusing objects with a powerful salve called Dawn Glow. These harrowing journeys are highlighted in cards like Medic Runner and Safe Right Quest. Their search for purity manifests in the elves' transition from black mana to white, which we can see in the cards Elvish Hex Hunter and Safehold Elite. This symbolizes a shift towards hope and a deep-rooted sense of shared duty in natural conservatism. Shadowmoor Elves' stance on beauty shifts from one of forced aggression to one of hopeful protection. They no longer seek to bring beauty by the blade, but rather defend what little beauty remains. This is highlighted in the flavor text of Drove of Elves, which reads, The light of beauty protects our journeys through darkness, and also an oracle of nectars which states, When elves find a fount of beauty, they protect it. Where there is beauty, there is hope. Three ancient tribes of elves roamed the verdant wilds and untamed forests of Ravnica long before the encroaching cityscapes supplanted nature and even before the Guild Pact document was made manifest. Though the passage of time has changed their culture and they've taken on characteristics of their respective guilds, two of the three elvish tribes exist in modern Ravnica. The Devkarin are the dark elves of Ravnica, equally in tune with death and decay as they are with life and growth. Their deep connection to black and green mana naturally drew them to the Golgari Swarm, and they rule the Undercity in positions of aristocratic power, shepherding the actions of much of the Swarm. Most elves within the Golgari act as shamans and use their potent magic to command the cycle of rot and regrowth, their discerning feature being tattoos or painted markings covering their faces or arms called mood marks, which we can see in the art of cards like Golgari Find Broker and Deathrite Shaman. So great is their command over death that some elves have returned to the mortal realm as undead liches the likes of Jarad Golgari Lich Lord and Storev Devkarin Lich. The current leader of the Golgari is an elf by the name of Izoni Thousand Eyes. There exists a legion of ancient elves preserved within the catacombs of the Undercity for millennia that the swarm raised during the War of the Spark to wage war against Nicol Bolas's Dreadhorde. These elves, known as the erstwhile, retain their ancient trappings and give us the best glimpse into the lives of the contemporary elves' ancestors, which we can see in Awaken the Erstwhile and Erstwhile Trooper. The second tribe of ancient elves were the Silhana, and they found an accepting home within the confines of the Silesnia Conclave. Silhana are expert scouts and wayfinders, navigating Ravnica's dizzying heights and spires with ease, and acting as long-range troops in defense of Matt Silesnia. Many other elves exist within the Conclave, drawn by senses of duty, community, and greater purpose. They're trained as clerics to heal the wounded seen in cards like Conclave Guildmage, shamans to bring harmony to nature or stir its wrath, 
seen in Tristani Summoner, or mounted knights to fight tooth and sword alongside their wolves for the cause, seen in Ladev Champion. The third ancient tribe of elves met their destruction long ago and under mysterious circumstances, but their survivors sought refuge within the Simic Combine and quickly filled a vital role within the guild. Simic elves are masters of experimentation, augmentation, and foresight, combining their innate connection to nature with the scientific knowledge gleaned from their studies as wizards and mages. Simic elves are constantly reimagining what it means to be natural and spur drastic evolutionary changes on large scales. They tend Simic growth chambers, seen in the card's growth chamber guardian and incubation druid, and also weave mana ley lines to fuel the growth of their organic amalgamations, as depicted in Gyre Sage and Zamek Guild Mage. Two revolutionary minds led the Simic Combine throughout its history, the aloof and enigmatic Momar Vig and Vanifar, the current prime speaker of the Simic. Several other elves exist within Ravnica's massive streets and consider themselves free spirits, members of the guildless. The fact that nature has been beaten back by the technological advancements of civilization does little to inhibit the elves' predilection for verticality and connection with verdant life wherever it can be found. The flavor text of Elvish Skysweeper states, The spires of Ravnica are no different from the tall trees of other plains. The elves navigate and protect them just the same. This exploratory urge ensures elves' constant employment as district guides, wayfinders, and cartographers, seen in cards that share such names. But now we leave the vaulted spires of the world city behind, and venture forth into the frozen and untamed wilds of Kaldheim's realms. The elves of Kaldheim are native to the realm of Skemfar, and have a deep history that depicts the illustrious heights of their golden age as well as their inevitable fall at the hands of the Skoti, who supplanted them as gods. In ages past, the ancestors of the elves were known as Aenir, and they wielded the power of the world tree, the power of godhood. But they were usurped by the Skoti, stripped of their power, and imprisoned within Jespera trees. The Skoti, fearing reprisal, then split their descendants into two separate factions, the green-aligned wood elves and the black-aligned shadow elves. For centuries, these two factions warred with another and fell to depredations of bitter infighting until Harald united them once more underneath a single banner. Kaldheim's elves have a deep sense of honor and ambition. They wish to reclaim the status of godhood they once enjoyed, which we can see in the flavor text of Skemfar Avenger which reads, Stripped of their divinity, the elves of Skemfar channeled their rage and sorrow into bloody brutality. Harald directs their motivations to fulfill this end. The elves of Skemfar worship Koma, the great cosmos serpent, who embodies the perpetual cycle of life and death that the two clans represent in green and black mana. They believe growth and decay are two ends of the same string, and only through complete devotion to both can they yield great reward. Their devotion and connection to the serpent are showcased in the cards Koma's Faithful and Elder Fang Disciple. The predilection towards both green and black mana makes Kaldheim's elves intriguing but not quite unique, as we have seen the elves of Ravnica and those of Lorwyn also have strong ties to black mana. Though nature abounds with life, it is the fate of all things to wither, decay, or die. But in such finality is the opportunity to foster new growth, to promote the next generation, and continue the natural process. Perhaps elves that share in both black and green mana are more deeply in tune to nature than those who wield only green mana. Though we've explored many races of elves in great detail, there exist several other races across the multiverse. Now, we'll briefly touch on some of these lesser elvish races who either have less significant roles in the history of their respective planes, or those from which we have little information to glean. We'll begin with the technologically advanced plane of Kaladesh. In our study on elves, it would seem elvish culture would be incompatible with a plane dominated by artifice and unnatural works of production, civilization and technology at odds with, and competing against nature for space. On the surface, the elves of Kaladesh stand distinct and heretical, not only tolerating artifice but embracing it completely. But these elves haven't forgotten their deep roots in green mana and organic growth. Kaladesh is a vibrant plane where the ether suffuses all things, cultivates development, fuel civilization, and powers gears. The elves call the flow of ether the Great Conduit, and they see how it bridges the gap between nature and artifice. This broad view allows them to manufacture brilliant designs shaped by what already exists in the natural world, fusing creativity with the Great Conduit's design. 
We see this sentiment echoed in the flavor text of Pima Outrider, which reads, Connected as artificer and invention, bonded as rider and steed. And in Servant of the Conduit, we hear, Creation without connection to nature is just manufacture. Most elves dwell in Kaladesh's vibrant, expansive forest of Pima, where they shepherd beasts, plants, and other natural life, while at the same time honing their skills as metal spinners and artisans. Other elves dwell within Girapur's overgrown and dangerous green belt, known as the Cal, offering refuge to the renegades fleeing consulate law. When the Aether Revolt broke out and civil war between renegades and consulate consumed Girapur, many of the elves joined the renegade cause, believing that artifice, just like nature itself, must be free from constraints and allowed to grow. We hear this in the flavor text of Rishkar Pima Renegade, in which the elvish rallier states, Aether is the soul of Kaladesh, and all souls should be free. And the elves' conviction to the cause is heard again in the flavor text of Greenwill Liberator. I will not rest until every vestige of the consulate, every banner, flag, and standard has fallen. The fairy tale plain of Eldraine is divided into two large tracts of land, the realm where the High King holds court and where valiant knights showcase their valor in jousts, tournaments, and other feats of skill, and the wilds, a lawless and untamed land suffused with magic, overgrown, and a haven of witchcraft and bestial predators. The elves of Eldraine are an ancient race that once ruled the civilized lands of Eldraine in several elven kingdoms. With the rise of humanity, elves were beaten back, their illustrious kingdoms crumbled, and their proud heritage covered in shameful defeat. Their survivors and descendants retreated to the safety of the wilds, where they could commune more easily with nature and find refuge in the dense thickets. The last of the great elven kingdoms remained within the realm, and now functions as a sort of vassal to the human kingdom. Its court is held in Castle Lochthwain, presided over by Queen Ayara, the first of Lochthwain. She is the only elf represented on the plain that is tied to black mana, perhaps demonstrating the last vestige of the once great elven kingdoms. The elves that lurk in the wilds are primarily aligned with green mana and are themselves divided into various bands. Each band is run by a circle of druids deeply in tune with nature that confer with another to mitigate discord between bands. Elvish warriors are adept hunters and trackers, riding valiant fox steeds into battle, which you can see in the art of cards like Merrileaf Rider and Wildwood Tracker. The Shard of Naya on the fractured plain of Alara is home to the Cillian Elves, a race that deftly wields red, green, and white mana flowing throughout the Shard. Naya is a world of unbridled growth and ferocity, where behemoths trod the earth and smaller creatures, elves included, must take to the forest canopy for safety. Cillian Elves worship the behemoths and offer sacrifices to placate these monstrous beasts, seen in cards like Behemoth's Herald and God Toucher. Nyan Elves are led by the Anima, a blind shaman granted powerful spiritual visions and future sight to better attune the tribes to the whims of nature. Central to their religious ideologies is the belief in Progenitus, the world soul of Alara that slumbers deep beneath the surface, but whose awakening could spell disaster for existence. The Cillian Elves guard Progenitus's resting place and ensure it doesn't stir from its slumber, which we can see in the card Keeper of Progenitus. With the conflux of Alara, Naya opened up to the other shards and the elves' beliefs were challenged. Some chose to worship the dragons of Jund, whom they viewed as the most powerful symbols of nature's raw power, seen in the card God Tracker of Jund. Others sojourned to lands uncharted, carrying the anima standard and guiding the elves into an uncertain future. Like most other creatures on the metallic plain of Mirrodin, Elves were not native, but their ancestors instead kidnapped through the blind eternities through the use of soul traps by the plane's twisted warden Memnark. These displaced elves found safety and community within the artificial forest known as the Tangle and called themselves the Viridian Elves. Mirrodin's elves were tall and slender with light blue or pale green skin, and like most other creatures on the plane, had metal plates that grew as a form of carapace. Despite Mirrodin's cold steel, Green mana and natural life was present on the plane, and the elves were instinctively drawn to it. Their mission became the preservation and creation of what little natural life existed, which quickly grew into hatred towards anything artificial. They vehemently attack unnatural beings and structures of artifice with great disdain, seen in the cards Viridian Zealot and Viridian Shaman, whose flavor text reads, Because the elves are so untouched with Mirrodin's nature, they understand best how to dismantle it. 
Viridian elves were obsessed with protecting Mirrodin's history etched onto the largest tree in the Tangle, known as Tel Jalad, the Tree of Tales, and those who guarded its secrets bore the name Tel Jalad, which you can see in the Outrider and Chosen. When the glistening oil overtook Mirrodin and corrupted it into new Phyrexia, many elves succumbed to completion, their very souls twisted to evil. They remain in the Tangle and act as stewards of the green-aligned Praetor Vorinclex's vicious swarm, cultivating a natural life and propagating completion. The flavor text of Viridian Betrayers tells us that Phyrexianized elves hunt those that have yet been corrupted by glistening oil and reeds. To secure a place in Phyrexia's ranks, they hunted their surviving kin. Elves, a race brilliantly in tune with nature, a culture that seeks balance and harmony between life and death, a people that tend growth and shape the will of the forest to protect what they hold dear. Thank you so much for watching and listening to this study in nature as we uncovered the characteristics of elves in Magic the Gathering. Now I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts on elves, which plan has the most interesting race, as well as suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, consider subscribing to the channel or checking out the podcast where content is uploaded frequently. Again, a huge shout out to all of my Patreon supporters who make all of this possible. I couldn't do it without their spectacular patronage. If you're interested in becoming a lore luminary for access to me, scripts, a great community, and early video drops, check out the link below or head to patreon.com slash the librarians to learn more. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.